What I have here is a 58-year-old man with weakness. And what I would like you to do now is I'll answer questions and you ask me about my presentation. Um, so what, what would you like to know about my weakness? I'm this 58-year-old man. Um, so I have some weakness on the right side. Uh, it's been going on uh, for maybe a week or two. Well, I certainly notice it in my right hand, my right arm, and yeah, that, that's really my main problem. I'm just not holding on to things really well. Is it constant or intermittent? Uh, it's pretty constant. I notice it more sometimes than others, but it may just be because I'm doing more things with my right hand at times than others. Does anything make it better or worse that you've noticed? Not really. Do you wake up with it in the night? Um, no. Does it, does it affect your face or your leg? Uh, well, my wife said that I mumble a little bit, so maybe you know, if I look in the mirror, maybe a little bit on that side. Um, no, I don't really. My leg, maybe I'm limping a little bit, but it doesn't feel that weak now. Do any sensation changes? Um, mm, no. Any pain? N not in the arm, no. Are you, are you well? Do you have fever or do you feel well in yourself? I don't have a fever. I feel okay. I've been having a bit of a headache. But, you know, everyone gets headaches. Any problems with vision? Uh, not really. I've had a bit of blurred vision the other day when I woke up in the morning, but otherwise seems to be okay. Did you have a reason for? Uh, no, not that I recall. Have you always got headaches, or is this a new development? Oh, you know, everybody gets headaches. Um, you know, you get headaches. too many drinks here and there. Um, but uh, yeah, no, this is a little bit different. It's been, you know, I've been taking Panadol, it's just not going away. I mean, it's not a bad headache. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean to complain about it. But um, it's they're getting worse. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Mostly, they're just not getting better. Where is the headache? Um, all over the everywhere. Everywhere. Yep. So what are you thinking at this point? So you're thinking CT. <laughs> That's not what I want you to say. It's an exercise and localization. Um, so where, where do you think this problem might be? Why? Um, headaches, unilateral weakness, uh, probably at the moment in Europe. Why upper motor neuron? So you're doing the syndromic thing. So you're combining <coughs> the various symptoms into what you think the diagnosis is, rather than looking at the distribution of the symptoms to come up with a localization. So let's do that. So, so let's move up from the bottom, bottom up. Could it be a muscle problem? No, no. It's unilateral. Muscle it's problems can right. never be unilateral. Yes, it can. Yes, it yeah, but not. But they don't usually give you a headache. They don't usually give you a headache, that's true. So unless you have some autoimmune condition that's causing a headache and a muscle problem. So you're right, so muscle problems tend to be bilateral um, and they tend to be in the limbs more than the face. But can you absolutely exclude a muscle problem at this stage? No. You cannot. Um, can you exclude a nerve problem? You cannot. No. Can you exclude a neuromuscular junction problem? In fact, could it be a neuromuscular junction problem? Could this be myasthenia gravis? You'd expect it's symmetrical. Um, you would, it's but you don't. It's not always symmetric. Um, and you, you're reporting a little bit of weakness in the lower face, but you certainly can get this arthritis with myasthenia. You can certainly get fluctuating sh symptoms the more you do with the hand, which is something that he reported. So it could be. Could it be um, a plexus problem, a brachial plexus problem? It absolutely cannot be a brachial plexus problem because it's involving the face. All right, so you've definitely excluded that one. Can it be a spinal cord problem? Yes. It cannot be a spinal cord problem because the facial nerve comes off the brain stem. So there's nothing in the spinal cord that controls the face as far as motor function is concerned. 
So it cannot be a spinal cord problem. Can it be a brain stem problem? Yes. 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 Can it be anything in the above the brain stem? Yes. It can be. So you, you, you think, and is it likely to be a nerve problem? What's, what's unusual about this from a nerve perspective? Solely motor. Solely motor. So you can get pure motor neuropathies, but it's less likely. So you've, you've, just, you've looking at either a muscle problem or neuromuscular junction problem or something from the brain stem or up. And you've arrived at that anyway, but you've now you've, you've come back to something you would have completely dismissed which is a peripheral muscle problem. And it may not be that. Now you're going to look at what other features there are and what other features are there. So you have the headache yeah. Yeah. Blurred and the blurred the vision, mm -hmm. the speech. So what about the blurred vision? Brainstem. Yeah. So, so brainstem? So how does a brainstem um, lesion cause blurred vision? So diplopia can cause blurred vision because it may be misinterpreted as blurred vision. That, that's the key, isn't it? A lay term, blurred vision, mm. can mean all kinds of things. And that's exactly the point yeah. I'm trying to make. Yeah. So, excuse me. Double vision, is that a so field defect, is it? So blurred vision is a really vague symptom, and you need to explore it a little bit further. So in somebody who presents with blurred vision, so a myasthenia gravis patient can have weakness and if he's right-handed, this is dominant arm, he's presenting with some dysarthria, some, um, because he thinks there's some asymmetry, but his main complaint around the speech problem, the mouth problem is actually that his wife has noticed his speech is slurred, he's got blurred vision, it could be diplopia, and all of that could be um, a, a myasthenic gravity. Would, would you expect the blurred vision to be worse as the day progresses over myasthenia gravis? It would, but nobody asked that. Well, you said it was in the morning he noticed it. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Wouldn't it be unusual to, to um, diagnose myasthenia gravis in a 58 year old? No, that's the group. No, that's the group. Oh, Older male, yeah. 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 males and younger women, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. middle yeah. age, so that yeah. would be a reasonable yeah. age. Yeah, that doesn't exclude it. So, so, so she picked up on the early morning double vision, uh, uh, blurred vision. So, what does that, what that makes you think about when you hear? Sorry. Raised. Raised intracranial pressure. So, how does how's blurred vision caused by raised intracranial pressure? Pressure on the. Pressure on what? <laughs> Sorry. Say that again. Great pressure on the cranial. So pressure on the brain, more specifically. Intraocular pressure. Yeah, it actually causes pressure out. You know, so when the brain swells, there's only so many places it can go. It can go down, or it can go through the eyeballs, and that's pretty much it. it won't go through the ears generally. I've not seen that. Um, so it causes papilledema, right? So papilledema causes blurred vision. It can also cause a cranial nerve six palsy, which is the abducens nerve, and can cause diplopia, and that's because of pressure down across when the brain stem brushes against the, um, the foramen magnum. That's also how you get your cranial nerve three palsies. Uh, when the brain pushes down, you compress the cranial nerve three as it traverses um, from the brain stem towards the cavernous sinus, bone pushes on it, and then you get your cranial nerve three palsy, which is your blown pupil, right? But this, this person doesn't have a blown pupil because they're wide awake, they're coming in, they're just having a little bit of weakness, numbness, we're not quite that dramatic at this stage. Okay, so, 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 we're, so now the diplopia, you can ask him, does the double vision get better or does the blurred vision get better when you cover one eye? It, people do this. So when they get blurred vision, they may not have blurred vision now, but when somebody gets blurred vision, they instinctively go like this and check. It's almost like we're wired to do this. So some people, not all people do that, but you do need to ask. They will never volunteer this because they think they're being kind of silly to do that. But if it gone away, the double vision, with having covered either eye, then you know it's what? Diplopia. Then it's diplopia and it's from the brain stem and it's less likely to be intracranial pressure. So you ask this person to do that, to, if they've done that, and they say, yes, I've done that, but I had blurred, the blurred vision maintained even when I covered either eye. And you ask, is it worse in one direction of gaze or the other? Why might you ask that? Where the pressure is? Uh, not so much about the pressure, what were you saying? 
So, so you can um, pick out more diplopia depending on which direction of gaze it is. That's not what I was after, but that's true. Nystagmus, so that's something you can tell, not so much the patient. So I was talking, thinking about a visual field defect. So people also will talk about blurred vision when they have a hemonymous hemianopia. So they'll say, my vision isn't quite right, it's a bit blurred, but what they really mean is they cannot see well out of that side, but they see everything over here because they have a visual field loss. So you do want to ask that, especially when you're thinking about people who might have a TIA or stroke. It's good to get a bit of clarity on that. Now, in this particular patient, you are all on the right track. We're starting easy. We're getting, gets more difficult. So this particular patient did have increased intracranial pressure that caused headache and then presented, then developed some weakness in the right arm and the face. Um, the one other thing that this patient had that you didn't ask that is a good clue when you're trying to look at a space-occupying lesion is whether they've had anything that might be a seizure. Okay, so as it turns out, this particular patient has had two funny turns where they blanked out, where they uh, lo looked into space and people were not being able to get his attention um, and he dismissed them because he didn't think it was anything major. And what might that be? Complete passion. So a complex partial seizure. So he's had a couple complex partial seizures. So, so now you're going to get your CT, and what do you expect to see on the CT scan? Something nasty. <laughs> Where would you expect to see something nasty? On the left, left side and the middle. The left side and the middle. Okay. Any other thoughts? So where does motor live? So we have heard no sensory problems. Motor cortex, On the frontal, okay? So the brain, the uh, frontal cortex does motor, the parietal cortex does sensory, temporal lobe does memory, occipital lobe does vision, in a nutshell. A bit more complicated than that. So here's your scan, and there's your tumor, and there's surrounding edema. This is a pretty nasty looking tumor. That's probably a GBM, glioblastoma multiforme. It could be a other high grade glioma. It's not likely to be a meningioma or anything like that. And the reason why I say that is because it's contrast enhancing, it's heterogeneous looking, and it has lots of edema around it. So this is a fairly rapid growing tumor. Um, and just to, for uh, educational purposes, so this is another MRI scan. Um, it's a T1 image. This is also a T1 image, and you can tell that because the ventricles are dark, so you don't see the uh, CSF. Um, and this is another T1 image post-contrast. So you see the tumor. This is, would be a lower-grade tumor. This looks more like a glioma or oligodendroglioma. Um, nicely circumscribed. You see this is a bit um, nodular. So the, the uglier it's looking, the worse it is. For the thumb, this looks kind of pretty. A little egg thing. Um, and then when you do the T2 image, which you see now is the ventricles are bright white, that shows you water. T2 images shows you water, and you see how all of that is edema. So just to show the difference, this is the sort of thing we do when we talk about MRI scan. So <clears throat> now this patient presented with weakness. Um, but he also had headaches, so I thought I'll take this as an opportunity to review the headache red flags. And, and this is something that you do all the time, and it's probably the most common call I get from GPs. I'm getting a, a headache story, and the question is, could this be a subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? That's the big fear that we're going to miss, the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so subarachnoid hemorrhage is, and this guy didn't have that, and every, I think we're all more con uh, confident about picking up headache due to a tumor because it has that morning headache, uh, the increased intracranial pressure, the focal neurology, um, you know, and you, you have a little more time, you can see if it gets worse over time, you get the scan. I think, get, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the biggest anxiety we all have is about missing that subarachnoid. When you have somebody with a new severe headache and you need to decide, do you send them to ED or not? Right? I, I find that challenging too. I find the phone calls challenging. Only one in 10 people who we think who presents with a thunderclap type headache ends up having a subarachnoid, subarachnoid hemorrhage, but that's one in 10, you know, that's quite a lot of them. Um, so sudden onset of severe headache, and it almost always is severe, so the milder headaches we do not worry about. 
and it has to last some time. So that's probably the group you can most easily remove from your list of concerns. It's those headaches that are stabbing that last 5, 10, 15 minutes, even if they occur in the setting of sexual intercourse, so that I get a lot of calls around that because we know that sex headaches, we worry about increased intracranial pressure um, causing a ruptured aneurysm. The vast majority of those are completely benign and they go away pretty quickly. So more than in an hour and generally even more than that. So usually they, you want them to last uh, several hours, even the sentinel bleed ones. Okay. Um, later on as the headache progresses, you get some neck stiffness that usually takes a little while to occur. Obviously if you have a rash, you think meningitis. Uh, about 30 to 50% of people with subarachnoid hemorrhage will have depressed level of consciousness and a lot of them vomit because of that rapid increase in intracranial pressure. Um, these are signs of increased uh, intracranial pressure that you're well aware of. We already talked about the visual changes. If you have any weakness or focal neurology that you can convince yourself in the patient, you want to get a scan. So that's, that's the most concerning bit. Now, if we talk, we'll talk about funny sensory symptoms, so the tingle in the little finger I'm not talking about, or even the tingling that moves over minutes down an arm that you see with a migraine nurse. So you need to have some understanding of what migraine-related um, sensory symptoms sound like, and they tend to, be po tend to be positive tingling rather than a numbness. And the ones that I really worry about are the weakness, even if it's hemiplegic migraine. I mean, you want to scan these people at least once. Um, so you wouldn't ever want to just take a diagnosis of somebody who has acute left-sided weakness, even if they've had migraine forever, and this is their usual migraine headache. If this is the first time if that was your daughter, you would want them to have a scan, wouldn't you? Even if it all sounds like hemiplegic migraine. They're so rare, I think we can do a few scans in those people. Um, and this is more the, the increased intracranial pressure that we had in this patient. And then another good one is um, th these, the bad headaches tend to occur in older people. Um, so, you know, it's a, a rule of thumb. So it's tricky, but it's the sort of thing that um, we, we need to just keep being vigilant about. All right. Now we have another headache case. 34-year-old woman with worsening headaches. What would you like to know about her? Worsening over what period of time? Um, about 12 weeks. Are they constant or intermittent? Um, they wax and wane, but now they're constant. They started off as intermittent, and now I have a headache all the time. And has she had them before? Oh, sorry, from morning to night. And um, currently they're there all the time. Has she had them before? Um, uh, yeah, I've had headaches before. Th what I have now is definitely different than what I've had before. But yeah, I've had headaches before. And what's the headache like? Um, so it tends to be, it, it, it's a two kinds of headaches. There's the one that I have all the time. Um, it's a dull, achy headache. Um, and then I get these episodes that last several hours on top of that um, okay. over my right side. Um, and yeah. Just <coughs> seem to be really bad. Have you had any strange turns? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not really. No. What do you mean, like passing out or something like that? Yeah, kind of thing. Or, or no, no, nothing like that. What's your pattern of um, pain relief use of analgesic use? Well, I started off with Nurofen, and I've been, you know, that worked okay, and then the headaches got worse and. That, that I'm taking that all the time now, and it seems to help. It makes it a little bit better, but um, I have to take it pretty much every six hours. They present on waking. Yep. Present when you go to bed. Hmm? They present when you go to bed. Present when I go to bed. Present when I wake up. Do they wake you up? Uh, I'm not sure. I sometimes wake up in the night and they're there. I'm not sure if they wake me up. If you didn't have headaches, how would you be otherwise? fine. I just want to get rid of these headaches and I'm worried I have a brain tumor. Do I have a brain tumor? <laughs> <laughs> Do you get that question? I get that question all the time. Have you recently changed medication or stopped using medication? No, just the Nurofen. Do you have children? I do. Are you breastfeeding? No. Are you on the pill? Um, no. 
artificial changes? Uh, sometimes, but sometimes I feel a little bit blurry. And I get the bad headache, maybe, maybe. I think so. Oh, do you work outside of work? I do. What, what's your occupation? I am a medical secretary. You spend a lot of time on computers? I do. And outside work? Do you have leisure activities? Not now, because my headache is so bad, but I used to like to go tramping. Is there a family history of migraine? Um, not sure. My mother had some headaches at times. I would leave her at home and tell us all to go away and not be loud, but maybe those were migraines. I'm not sure. So what do you, th can I just stop for a second? So what are you thinking at this point? <coughs> So she has a red flag and that the headaches are gradually worsening. So that's important. Constant. Constant. So what does that make you think? So you worried uh, should be worried about medication overuse and, and how would that explain her presentation? Yep, so she so took it intermittently at first, headaches became more frequent, and now she's taking it four or six hourly, constantly, and she has a daily headache. So that's sort of a classic presentation for analgesic overuse headache. We haven't asked about weakness or... Yeah, oh, yeah you so haven't, you yeah. haven't. That's um, the next question. <laughs> 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 but you've said there'd be nothing else if you didn't have headaches, she'd otherwise... She did fine. say that, yeah. but it's, it's, yeah, so she did say there wasn't anything else, and you'd think she volunteered, but I agree, it's always good to check whether there is something, and you would examine this woman briefly to make sure there isn't anything, um, but she doesn't have anything. Does anything exacerbate the headaches? Um, well, bright light and loud noise. <laughs> so these are good questions to ask when you're worried about... Yeah, my sleep, how you sleep that? Horribly. Why do you ask? Well, I ask because I had a teenager that was getting headaches for three weeks. And when I asked him how he's sleeping, he goes to bed. He was 13 and he goes to bed at 1 because he's playing this. And, and tell him to stop his being dressed. And his mum said, oh, I think you're supposed to be asleep. Mm -hmm. That sounds like Mike. And that's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so sleep deprivation. All right, so <clears throat> this lady has analgesic um, rebound or overuse headache. Um, with an underlying migraine diagnosis. So I thought we also should, so we talk a lot about bad headaches, but of course most of what we see are what we call benign headaches, which is a real kind of a misnomer because they often uh, have horrible impact on quality of life. So what do you do when you have that patient, the heart sink patient, right, who has this ongoing headache and you're like, oh, what are you going to do if you got your 10 minute uh, consultation and um, how are you going to help this this uh, patient. So we'll talk a bit more about, let me just see. Okay. So analgesic rebound or overuse headache. Um, that's the, one of the most underdiagnosed headache syndromes out there. And uh, the, the reason why it's important to get that one right is because the worst thing you can do for these people is to give them more drugs to make it worse. And that tends to be the knee-jerk reaction in a busy surgery to this, okay, the ibuprofen isn't working, let's give you some codeine. And, you know, it happens because we're busy and we want to we wanna do something and it'll probably help a little bit. It'll be a little bit more effective than the norepinephrine, and, and then it'll stop working. And then they come back and then you rev up the narcotics and then you might have this brilliant idea and say, oh, let's add some sumatriptan because I, now I got it, this, um, these are migraines. And then you, they start taking that, it's now over the counter, they take that every day, and that also causes rebound headache. So just about every PRN medication used for headache can cause rebound, even paracetamol. <coughs> so just be really mindful of that. Uh, the, the, so what I do with these people is I suggest, I, I explain this to them, and people, you know, it's easy to explain. It's because the, what, the way I explain it, I don't actually know that this is actually what the cause is, but this is how I explain it, is that you're treating the headache and the body gets used to the medication, and then as soon as the medication wears off out of your system, your body then develops a headache to get more of the medication, just like an addiction to any other drug. And that's probably about what happens. Uh, I just don't have great scientific evidence for that. And people understand that concept. And then they want to get rid of the drug. 
because most of these people aren't drug addicts, and certainly they don't get any pleasure out of the neurofin, so you know, why, why keep taking it? Most people don't want to take medications. So, but the problem is if you stop at cold turkey, then you get this massive, severe headache that can push you into status migraine. Because remember, these people do have headaches. It's not like they're functional. I mean, they start off with a genuine headache syndrome, severe headache that's driven them to use these tablets. And that may, they may increase because of stress, perimenopause, periods, you know, I mean, any life changes, <coughs> smog, diet, it's all sorts of triggers out there that can suddenly make it worse. We often don't know what they are, and I don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out what caused that worsening of the headache, although you'll, have, you, you'll know this, a lot of patients fixate on that. What caused it? Why do I have this now? And you need to redirect them and say, we may never figure out what made the headache worse. I can get that scan for you if you're worried, but I, you need to know I'm only doing it to give you peace of mind. I know you don't have a brain tumor because I've just examined you and I don't see anything you don't have other than progressive headache. There's no red flag here and you have a history of migraine. You've had a few during your 20s, now you're 35 and they're getting worse. And you have four kids at home and you're working and you're having all the stress and I, that's enough for me to make the diagnosis. So let's start by trying to solve the current problem. If you still have ongoing headaches after that, we'll reconsider. So that's usually, so I would not scan this person. Um, so what I do is, so you cannot just stop it. So what I do is I replace the PRN drug with naproxen. So naproxen 500 milligrams is a um, non-steroidal that has a longer half-life. It's a 12-hour half-life, so you can take it twice a day regularly. And for some reason, maybe because it's longer acting, it does not seem to have the same problem with rebound headache. And then I combine that with a low dose of amitriptyline or nortriptyline. And I do that for two reasons. One is because to transition them, because we cannot use the, uh, the naproxen for more than a couple of weeks because it'll start causing stomach problems. Um, and then you have something on board that's by then built up. And two, to help them sleep. Uh, because a lot of these people don't sleep well. And that's often a contributing factor. Uh, so I use 10 milligrams of amitriptyline. For that very reason, I like in these people amitriptyline rather than nortriptyline. So nortriptyline in general is better tolerated. Uh, but it doesn't cause, because it's better tolerated, because it doesn't make you so sleepy, but I actually want them to have good sleep. And it's not long term, so I use it for a month or two until we've made it through. And then you can reassess. You can stop it. If the migraines come back with a vengeance to a week, you might restart it. If they don't tolerate the nortriptyline or amitriptyline, you can switch them to something like topiramate. Um, that, that would be generally my next drug. Epilin works quite well as well. Unfortunately, of course, a lot of these, win these are women in childbearing uh, age groups, so you wouldn't want to use epilin in them. The good thing about epilin, though, is it doesn't interact with oral contraceptive pills, which Topamax does. So um, it's quite good if they're very good at taking their oral contraceptives and have no plans on having a pregnancy. It's not unreasonable to take epilin. Also, epilim, it, migraine is a much lower dose than epilepsy, so the risk, the fetal risk is uh, lower. Can, can I just ask, most of us have got a lot of uh, elderly patients with osteoarthritis who are on regular Panadol, Panadine, ibuprofen for their hip joints and knee joints, you know, prior to getting their replacements done. Do they get the same um, overuse headaches as well? So usually not. Um, so the... the, the it seems to be that if you start taking, and, and I don't know how the body figures this out, but it seems to be that when you start taking the analgesics for something other than headache, that you're much less likely to develop analgesic rebound headache. But it can occur. And I've had one patient, a young person, this is years ago, uh, this sort of really worried chap who started taking aspirin because he thought that he might have a heart attack. I mean, he was 35 or something, he had no vascular risk factors, but just thought it would be a good idea. And he induced a analgesic rebound headache with that, stopped the aspirin, the headache went away. So I've seen that once. Um, and it's harder to sort in the older people because they're taking so many other drugs. Um, but but I, I, do will, I will give that a go, at least replace it with something. The other thing that you can do, because you're constantly at risk of having it come back, Right? Because they still have headaches, they've got to take something, and if paracetamol works, you're not going to tell them, you know, take sumatriptan or whatever, you know, that, not that, that also causes problems, but you know, you've got to tell them to take something, and you cannot put everyone on prophylactics, and you shouldn't. 
but you can tell them to uh, alternate. So the, the, what I tell people is any two days a week you can take a drug. So norepinephrine, paracetamol, take them on two days per seven days. Doesn't matter how much you take on that day, well, within reason. Um, but uh, any more than that, you need to start worrying about inducing uh, rebound headaches. So it, it isn't a day. It doesn't have to be daily. It can be three or four days a week and start triggering this pattern. And so what I do with elderly people, I might ask them to mix a little bit, do some paracetamol, some norepinephrine, and see if it helps. And only if they actually have the headache. I find it's often young women that get these rebound mm. headaches, and they're very hard to talk down and reduce their analgesic use. Mm. Yeah, it's, it depends. You know, even introducing them to and things like yeah. that, it takes a lot of talking down while you're back. I haven't had so much problem with We probably that. don't see into those ones. Uh, well, I mean, I used to work in a headache center, um, mm. and so we did in, in private practice in America, so I trust me, I saw lots of pretty benign headache patients. Um, and, and you're right, I mean, I, but I find that the easier, it is easier to get rid of the paracetamol and the norepinephrine when you start getting into the codeine or the oxycontin, it becomes really <laughs> difficult. Um, so that does still happen in places, and that's what you need to avoid. So when, you, th when, they, when they've been having that rebound headache, I've had a patient who had a rebound headache for 30 years. We stopped the analgesics and the headache went away. So, but you need to keep that from happening, and that's you guys, you know? So you see these people, don't go the codeine route. Just do not use codeine for headache, because that's the springboard. And then it becomes a real drug problem, not just um, a headache-related drug problem. And we also know that narcotics actually cause uh, neuromodulation in the brainstem. And if you've taken narcotics for headaches for a long time, uh, there's a good chance you'll never get rid of the headaches because you've now altered neuronal pathways. So you'll always have headaches when you stop the drug. So there's um, increasing evidence around that. So, so basically, narcotics for headaches is just a no-no unless they have a brain tumor or a palliative. Uh, so, so just... Eight percent of paracetamol. Hmm? Eight percent of paracetamol. Um, yeah, or and when, when they don't work in sumatriptan. So for... Um, uh, the tramadol, some people, I mean, tramadol is another sort of borderline, but some people really find that helpful. You can use the naproxen as well as an abortive, um, a lot. and the other thing is use large dosages. So don't do one paracetamol. Get it early, the headache starts, have them take it before the headache reaches its peak. They know, they get the neck tightness, the feeling a little bit unwell, have them take something then and take, have them take you know, 600, 800 milligrams of norepinephrine that is much more effective than taking one and then taking one every hour thereafter because it doesn't go away. So, and you can combine sumatriptan with uh, naproxen or ibuprofen. Uh, so in some, I think in the States, they have a combination that works better if you combine. So you want to hit it fast and, and, um, and a high dose. Um, so most of these headaches are migraines, even if they don't quite meet, I have it on the next slide, the diagnosis. So to me, this whole, I don't know, the whole headache classification, I think they're all very interlinked. So this tension type headache thing, when you ask really carefully, they'll have had a headache that was really bad with some migraine features. And e so, so hangover headaches, right? So hangover headaches often have migraine features, photophobia, nausea, um, phon uh, phonophobia. So in, in they're not everyone gets hangover headaches. And they tend to be the migraineurs who get the hangover headaches. And then you have the stigma, especially men don't like to admit to having migraines. Um, they call it sinus headache. But it's, it's easier to call it a sinus headache, even though there's how many sinus headaches are there? How many people with full-blown sinusitis do you get who get headache? It's pretty rare. You think you call it a sinus headache, you send them to ENT, they have a little bit of effusion, they say, oh, it's nothing, we're not going to do anything about that. Has that happened to you? Mm -hmm. So it, most of these headaches are indeed migraine headaches, so it doesn't hurt to give it a try. Will you use your amitrope? You can continue that for your migraine prophylaxis potentially as well. Is the Nortrip as good for migraine prophylaxis as the Amitrip? So um, I, I, there's no trial data on this. They haven't done a head-to-head -head comparison because no drug company will make any money with that particular project. Um, I think that amitriptyline works slightly better than Nortriptyline out of my personal experience. 
but it is causes more sleepiness. So I, I, I get a history from the patient as to what their sleep pattern is. If they have no sleep problems and struggle getting up out of bed in the morning, I wouldn't use amitriptyline. What dose of nortrip do you use? 10. I start with 10, uh, go to 20, then 25. I usually just stick with the 10, sometimes to the 25s. And go, I don't hardly ever go beyond 50 milligrams. The other thing about migraine nerves, they are really sensitive creatures. They're sensitive to drugs um, as well, not just light, not just noise. Um, so the, you want to be you sometimes microscopic pills and, and uh, dosages. So amitriptyline is a little easier to cut even smaller, so you can sometimes do a half, which is five milligrams, and I've had patients that that works with them. The topiramate seizure dose is you know, up to 200 milligrams BD, that is hardly ever going to be tolerated by a migraine patient. I've had migraineurs on 25 milligrams at night, the pyramid, and, forth, and I rarely go above 50 milligrams. What does of echolin would you use for migraine? Oh, which one? What, what dose of echolin would you use for migraine? I'd start with 200 milligrams at night and then go to 200 BD. Um, with, uh, with migraine, you can get away with once a day dosing. Um, so some people will do 400 milligrams at night, which is easier. Uh, that's never made a whole lot of sense to me because the half-life isn't long enough to be once a day, but um, th there's been some work around that. And I do use, um, I don't know too much about headache, but it is an important topic. Um, I do use natural approaches as well, and that usually works very well with um, certainly certain patient populations, but in general, these are young, healthy people who don't want to have drug side effects. And the, the problem with that approach is it takes more time. And you may be better off sending them away and having them come back um, for a longer duration if you can manage to do that. And I don't know what, how you set up for that. But um, I um, have a sheet of, of dietary triggers and I ex suggest an exclusion diet. So I ask them to exclude everything on the list and then reintroduce after a month, one at a time, to see what the trigger is. So I've had lots of patients control their headaches by exclusion of certain, certain foods. So that's, I mean, the common ones you know of, red wine, chocolate, uh, cheese. Now there are other ones that you may not be so familiar with, citrus fruits, yeasty bread. So cheese is probably the worst thing you can give a migraine, uh, not cheese, um, pizza. So you have a very fresh yeasty dough with um, cheese on top of it. Onions can trigger migraines, and, and some people, tomatoes can trigger migraines. So it, it's sort of this, this horrible thing, and plus it's really unhealthy. Most people lose weight with the exclusion diet because there's a lot of really yummy foods on that. Uh, and then I, you can, I, I've added things to it from various people that have told me certain foods um, trigger their migraines. So, um, and I can send that around anyone's interested. The, I also use magnesium quite a bit, so I think magnesium oxide um, is a good migraine prophylactic, especially menstrual migraines. That's 500 milligrams twice a day. You can increase it to uh, three times a day. Eventually you'll get such loose stools that you cannot tolerate it, but sometimes if you combine it with low-dose amitriptyline, it fixes your constipation problem. <laughs> so it's, you can do that. Um, uh, speaking of menstrual migraines, doing the naproxen twice a day, uh, 500 BD, premenstrual, uh, can help to work ketamine migraines. So these women who get their migraines uh, day one through day three of their period or wherever during their cycle, if they're very regular, you can pre-treat them with that. Is there any evidence for the magnesium Yep, there is. Yes. So there have been randomized controlled trials. There's also evidence for magnesium sulfate. Um, intravenously for acute status migraine and I, I, it's usually in my protocol when I admit people for that um, it usually doesn't work but sometimes once in a blue moon it does and it's so well tolerated it's hard to argue with so yes it is evidence what about acupuncture massage exercise yeah. so very good question um, acupuncture uh, there are certain pain syndromes that I believe acupuncture works very well for. The problem with acupuncture, it's usually a temporary relief, which is the same with massage. Mm -hmm. So massage, uh, it, it, the, the, uh, it's, it's usually that the pain syndrome is triggered by something and then you get tight. Mm -hmm. And then you get the massage and it helps. 
but then the next day the headache is back. So it doesn't really get to the root of the problem. And I think that's the same for acupuncture. There have been randomized controlled trials on acupuncture that haven't been particularly helpful for a headache. Um, more helpful for things like neuropathic pain, or the disc back pain, I think. Is, is, uh, there's some evidence for neck and back pain, more so than headaches. Having said that, some people just swear by it. I just worry that it doesn't deal with the underlying problem and just, you know, uh, it becomes expensive after a while. Uh, the other thing, Botox. Botox, there is good evidence um, for Botox for migraine. It's obviously quite expensive and it's not offered um, in a lot of places, but it works really well for some people. And it's once every three months and it's a sort of thing that might be worth a private um, I don't actually know if they do Botox for headaches at Wellington Hospital. I guess they do in mid central. Yeah, they do it in mid central. Um, it has been found that it works so well that uh, yeah, it's the forehead. Um, so it's really easy. Um, so it's you just do around the eyes, um, temples, forehead, and neck, and sometimes sternocleidomastoid, uh, trapezius. Uh, the, the, it's not the skill isn't the problem; it's the cost of the drug that's the problem. Um, I mean, you, you shouldn't just do it. I mean, if you do get trained. So in this. Where, would you, where are you aiming to achieve it? Is it just sort of it's all over the place. And it's actually, it, it's not so much, so the idea, nobody really quite knows why it works. So the idea, obviously we think it's a muscle relaxant, but we also know that most migraines aren't caused by muscle tension. The muscle tension is actually a secondary problem. That's why massage doesn't give you lasting relief. But there is the, Botox does have anti-inflammatory um, effects as well. But why it lasts for three months, it's a little unclear. There's lots of skeptics who say it's just placebo, but they have done placebo control trials, and, and it works. Okay, any other? Okay. Um, so I just put just, you know, these are things that you can check for that can cause, most of them are not caused by these things, but um, if you just want to be sure, so vit some vitamin deficiencies can cause headaches, <coughs> iron deficiency, um, these um, uh, can cause uh, migraines or migraine type headaches, chronic headaches, <coughs> hypothyroidism, diabetes is actually one of the more common causes um, that's hard to deal with because how are you going to do other than controlling the sugars? But um, it is correlates to some extent with some um, high glucose um, loads. So uh, reducing their in, reducing high glycemic index foods. So more so than using the drugs, changing the diet can be helpful. So reducing carbs in your diet can help with that. Same with gluten. So I've had a few patients who actually are diagnosed gluten intolerance um, because of, they presented with headaches. So that's probably more common than we think and look for because we think of GI problems more commonly. Um, and sleep apnea is another big one that we often don't screen for that can cause headaches during the day. Now, I just glance through that. So, so migraine, I suspect most of you are pretty good at diagnosing them. Uh, I don't really use this rule, but I, kn I know people who find this helpful, the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 rule, more than five episodes, at least four hours in duration more than two of the following, two or more of the following, either unilateral, pulsating, moderately severe, or increased with exercise, one of the following, nausea, vomiting, photo, phonophobia, um, and then um, chronic daily headache is defined as a headache that occurs on more than 15 days per month, and then as I've already said, tension headache is, is usually just in my mind a milder migraine uh, type headache, they tend to occur in the same people. Uh, but there is perhaps a little bit more avenue to uh, work with things like massage and acupuncture and these types of headaches. Um, about migraineurs in general, like I've already said, they're sensitive to drugs, they're also sensitive to light, noise, smells, and sleep. So. Um, there's actually theories around that, that the neuronal firing threshold is set lower and people have migraines. So it's not they're, they're not antsy because they're worry wards. They're, they're just, um, they just respond more quickly to stimulus. So, if, so um, flickering lights, for example, but a computer screen. Um, so if you look, if you have a migraine or a look at a computer screen with a refresh rate, now we have LED screens, it's not quite the same, but the older computer screens that have a flicker rate or, or uh, fluorescent lights, uh, a lot of migraineurs see flickering. 
they, they look at the light and they actually see that it's not a static light, while other people don't get migraines don't see that. If you're in a, a room uh, full of people and they're talking, migraineurs will often say they can hear all the conversations. They struggle focusing on the one conversation in front of them because they're very um, have a high sensitive uh, it's high sensitivity and they pick up all these um, these conversations and then they get overload and then that can trigger headache. Can you look back from the childhood and did they do the same as children? Yeah, so children, so most, it's a lifelong condition and most people who have migraines in later life will have had headaches as children. Um, they're just not, they're just not as severe perhaps and or abdominal pains. So uh, kids, uh, uh, your kids who have the um, uh, hmm? abdominal migraine, the, um, uh, what do you call the babies who have the colic. colic. So that is a risk factor for migraine later in life. So it's a, it's a kind of pain, right? So um, the other things people, so growing pains. Kids who have growing pains, we all know they're not actually growing, right? It's not actually the physical growth of the leg that's happening. At least that's never been substantiated. We call them growing pains that happen in the kids. They correlate with migraines. Motion sickness. Sensitivity, again, you're sensitive to the motion of the car and it affects your vomiting nausea centers more quickly than somebody else. Um, so so it's, it's a slightly maladaptive hypersensitivity. Now, that I, this is something I use when I talk to my patients too to try and make it a slightly more positive thing and I have no evidence for this, but um, this, I, I, you know, they, I've been thinking, how can this be a good thing, right? Because we haven't gotten rid of it uh, evolutionarily. So there must be some benefit to that, and it's not hard to imagine that being hypervigilant could be a good thing. So you know, who wakes up when the baby rolls over in bed at night? It's the woman, <laughs> right? Women have migraine much more than men. Um, is it a good thing if both wake up in the middle of the night and one of them needs to go hunting the next day? You know, maybe it's survivally good to have a pair of parents, one who's very sensitive, stays around the home, watches for the tigers, you know, to, to be vigilant, like the meerkats. Um, um, and then, but and maybe it's not so good to be the hunter and going out and being hurt and feeling every bit of pain that you're feeling, um, because you need to keep going and hunting that uh, mammoth. Something. So this, th th I don't know if this is true, but that's sort of th th that. If I explain it to people that way, um, that rings true for a lot of, especially women who have migraines. And then it doesn't make it sound such a horrible thing. It just means you need, with a modern society, you have all these impulses stimuli, you just need to take care of yourself and remove yourself from that to give yourself a, a, a rest. And if you then don't sleep, which is restorative and helps you cope with that, then it compounds. And that's usually when we see things get worse. They get the headaches, then they don't sleep, they're stressed, they get more headaches, they sleep worse, they get more stressed because now the headaches are impeding their work, and they get more stress, sleep less, and then it just develops into this downward spiral. Um, is there any association with migraine risk of sleep? Not that I know of. You'd think there might be, but not that I know of. Yeah. They used to quote figures like 18% of women and 9% of men get migraine. Is that still the ballpark figure or is that just some random thing? I don't know. Sorry, but the incidence is. It's very common. That seems low to me. I think most people have a migraine at some point in their life. It's like seizure. You know, at some point, if you threshold, depending on you know, what you, you should probably can trigger a migraine just about anybody if the circumstances are strong enough, um, like seizure. If you're sick enough, you will have a seizure. Yeah. But that's the personal. Don't quote me. I mean, can you quote me? But, uh, there's these overlaps with irritable bowel syndrome as well. Um, you know, so again, sort of a hybrid, or chronic uh, pain, uh, um, fibromyalgia. So to me, fibromyalgia is very similar to migraine. And it's not, it doesn't mean they're crazy. It's just a different threshold for feeling pain. And it's real quality of life impediment if you're constantly in pain. And then you don't have a diagnosis and everyone says you're crazy. So I think fibromyalgia is a real thing and it can cause real problems if you don't address it. All right, I think I'm just going to move on. Are we sick of heading? Well, it's not the association with the combined pill of migraine? Um, yeah, I get these questions sometimes on referral letters. Should I, you know, I've had a letter last week from an ONG person. I want to start this person on combined oral contraceptive. She has migraine, 16-year-old girl. 
what can I do? How can I give her something else? And my, th th it's actually fairly um, variable, the response. And I would always recommend trying it first. And then if it does cause headache, then you rethink. But there's no, there's not, it's not that absolute, the correlation. Um, you, when they get older and you worry about car uh, cerebral vascular and vascular risk, it's a different issue. So there is an increased risk in migraineurs who have to have strokes and heart attacks. And if they also smoke and they're turning sort of 35-ish, you know, you probably want to avoid that to reduce the risk. Um, also, just with respect to the pill with migraine, am I correct what I have been told that if they are getting focal migraine with visual, absolutely must not be wrong? No, I disagree with that. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's um, so. There's slightly higher. There's, if you look at migraine and stroke, that's what they're worried about. Um, there is an increased risk in migraineurs with stroke, and there's a slightly greater risk in migraineurs who have aura. But overall, the risk is still so low that unless, so I would draw the line more than if they're smoking and have other vascular risk factors. So that in and of itself would not mean to me that you couldn't um, take the combined oral contraceptive pill. But it is a contentious topic and there are different views. The, the, yeah, the problem is that the data just isn't that great. Do you have a paper that discusses that you can search like? Is that I, I, yeah, I, I can look for one. I don't have one back pocket but um, I can I can look I, I suspect that even if you read a paper you could find another paper that says the opposite so that the problem is there isn't a very clear guidance on this and even if you look at international guidelines they don't all um, uh, coincide but I'll, I can look and see what I can find it's a bit of a so you so you're not singling out focal migraine you're saying migraine in general and the pills of the point when we've said they always picked on the migraine. So by Mind focal, so, so there's also different kinds of yeah. focal migraine. So if you're talking hemiplegic migraine, that's a completely different thing. So those I wouldn't use um, uh, oral contraceptive in. But when you're talking about somebody with a visual aura, that's what you're talking yeah. about, right? Yeah. So a visual aura, I don't feel that that's a contraindication. Uh, there's rationale for being careful in these people. But if they have a normal blood pressure, they're non-smokers, they're relatively young, um, and you know, I just don't think the evidence is there. It, you, could, you can tell them there's slightly increased risk because independently they both increase the risk. But then so you your response to the gynecologist wants to go for it? Yeah. <coughs> All right. Well, what's the difference about a sort of right out of this? Can you um, say anything about so I'll have to admit that dementia is, so the dementia cases I see tend to be odd ones, like Huntington's or frontotemporal dementia. Since moving to New Zealand, I don't see a lot of Alzheimer's disease. That's usually done by the geriatrician, so I probably will pass on that. I, I, would struggle to think that it would be really horrible, um, but that's the extent of what I'd probably pass on that. That's all right. Um, okay. The, the one other thing is about the headaches is do, do use um, preventative early. They're not so horrible. Um, so it's, it's a good way to get um, them and avoid rebound headache in the first place. How long would you, would you sort of set someone, someone up with the expectation to use it in three months or six yeah. months? So I or usually would you just leave it? No, I, I, because it's hard to sell to anyone for long term. Um, and, and I don't think it always is needed. So they come to you because the frequency has increased. So I look at underlying potential triggers like stress or diet. And then I recommend using something for three months, coming back at three months, seeing how they're doing. If they love it and they're having the time of their lives, I might give it another three months. Mm -hmm. And then tr a taper, if they have any degree of side effect or really keen to come off, I'd stop it at three months and see how they go and restart if they come back. <coughs> so three to six months is usually what I do. Mm -hmm.